In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus commissions his disciples with a worldwide missionary assignment. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Evangelism was the final instruction from Jesus to his followers. Today, generations later, the Great Commission remains the greatest calling of Christians to a lost world. Welcome to Mission Compass, your guide to the Great Commission, presented by Galcom International. On today's Mission Compass, we invite you to engage with us in fulfilling the Great Commission as we talk with mission workers about what God is doing through them as they share the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. Hello, friend, and welcome to another edition of our program, Mission Compass, presented by Galcom International. I'm Ron Harris. You know, the ministry of Galcom has a unique mission of sending the gospel message of Jesus Christ to those who have never heard it using radio and audio technology. Our goal is to help churches and mission organizations proclaim God's Word and His plan of salvation to the uttermost parts of the earth. And today, we have a special guest to talk about that. Here's our Mission Compass program host, Tim Whitehead. Well, friends, thank you for joining us again here on Mission Compass. If you have followed along with us at all for any length of time or the Galcom ministry, you've heard about Russell Stendhal, a missionary kid, grew up in Columbia, taken captive by the FARC rebels, was released, started a radio ministry, a big, powerful, shortwave radio station covering the whole nation and beyond, uh, covering big swaths of Latin America. And the incredible story of him dropping radios using mini parachutes from his airplane into the rebel-controlled jungles, just fearless, and how God used him, used the, the messages, the gospel messages over the radio to ultimately bring peace to the nation of Colombia. Well, the work in Colombia is, although it's not done, that heavy lifting is, is done, but Russell has expanded and he keeps introducing us to his friends that he's working in a ministry in Latin America. And I am thrilled that he introduced us to Merrill Dick a missionary in Latin America to a tribal group there who's been working on Bible translation. And now we're talking about getting audio Bibles and radios, radios tuned to Russell Station out of Columbia. Merrill, great to have you joining us. Great to be here, Tim. And uh, yeah, thanks for the invite. Now, I know we have to be careful uh, about where you're working and whom you're working with. So as vaguely uh, <laughs> as you can, share a little bit about the people group that you've been reaching out to for really 40 years? Yeah, we went in uh, 77. We moved into one of their villages in 77. We got permission from the village chiefs. They said, yeah, come on in. We had an interpreter with us. So yeah, we got the invite and they said, yeah, you can move in here. You can make your airstrip over here. And so we moved in. We built a palm hut, lived in the palm hut for four months while we built a mud and pole house. Then we just went into full bore language and culture study. We raised our two kids out there, and they both are missionaries now. And yeah, this was in South America, among a very special indigenous group. What a privilege to be God's ambassadors to these people and to start to learn their language. And their language was amazing. And we thought as we went through all this stuff, wow, the master linguist of the universe really knows how to do it. And uh, he really put together an amazing language that declared the glory of God. So tell me a little bit about this tribal group, this people group. I'll, I'll tell you why. Years ago, I'll never forget this. I was getting my hair cut. And of course, naturally, the hairdresser says, so what do you do for a living? I say, I'm a missionary. And normally people go, oh, what's that? Or interesting. And they change the subject. She says, what gives you the right to go into an area to tell them that what they believe is wrong and that you're right? And I was shocked. And I thought, I got to be careful how I answer this. She's got scissors at the back of my head. But what? gave you the right? How, why this people group? What did they believe when you got there and, and why them? Well, when we got to this particular country, the leadership asked us to consider working with this uh, group of people. We had already had our focus on another group, but they said, hey, what about this group? You guys are fit for this uh, people group. Uh, your wife is a linguist. You're a good language learner. You guys have the gifts that this people group need. And so we launched out and, uh, you know, we went because God said to go, you know, this wasn't our own little gig, but this was God's gig. He was uh, mandating this, you know, as we got to know the people better, they, they had a lot of smiles and a lot of laughs and stuff. But as we got to know them better and better, it was amazing how much 
fear came up in their culture and our culture file kept growing and growing and uh, so much on fear. So I'm afraid of, of, of this spirit bird and of that evil spirit and of this dead one and of this God and uh, all the prohibitions having to do with ladies during their time of the month and all the prohibitions about hunting and eating the wrong food and going out at night and evil spirits attacking the people because in the culture of these people, the evil spirits are their hunters and the people are like wild game for them to shoot and kill. So there were so many things that freaked them out. They thanked us over and over later on. They just said, you guys were so happy. We're totally without our liver because you guys came to live among us and give us God's true words. Amen. They were so thankful for the truth. But yeah, the Lord sent us out there. Clearly, it was his uh, mandate that sent us out. And both Teresa and I were, as new believers, we went. We both had contact with people who were excited about world missions. And uh, we heard about it and we were like, wow, there's these kind of people around the world. And then Jesus says to go. We thought, man, we're going to be goers. We're going to do this. Mm. Jesus said it, so we're going to do it. Amen. You mentioned you were new believers. I want to talk to you a little bit about your testimony, but you mentioned some of the, the physical trials when you first got there, had to you know build your little mud hut there and then move in. And you had a lot of trials. Uh, we were talking about this project together and you mentioned you were actually chased out of the area by gorillas. Yeah, that happened way later. That was after we had already been in there for 25 years. And uh, our leadership team had uh, mentioned several times, since you're close to the border, you have to be very careful. Uh, in another one of the countries there, they had already taken and killed some of our co-workers. Oh. Uh, we were not that far away. And uh, it turns out that suddenly we got word that it was time to go. It was time to go. And it was a crazy time. And I said, how much time do we have? And they said, the most we can give you is 10 days. And then you have to be out. So during those 10 days, we just grabbed photo albums, linguistic material, all the stuff we needed. And then we went and visited all the different villages where God had raised up churches. At this time, there was nine different village churches. And so we went through Acts 20 there, you know, where Paul is meeting the last time with the Ephesian elders. And he said, I wasn't stingy with you. I gave you the whole counsel of God. I wasn't here for your gold and silver. I was just here to give you the truth. And I've taught publicly and from house to house. And anyway, it so reflected what we had done during with, with these dear people for the 25 years that we, we decided to use that portion, which was already translated into their language. And yeah, we just wept. Teresa and I just wept as we went around and shared with these dear, beautiful, born again believers who had become our family totally. Yeah, it was a very, very hard departure from uh, the village there. We, we just, uh, it was the, one of the hardest things. Some of our supporters wrote and said, well, this is kind of good in a way, because now you're out and you're, you're in the city and you can go shopping and you can get a hamburger. And we we're like, oh, this is not what we wanted. We, we wanted to stay in there. And suddenly we're in a city of a million people on the ninth floor of an apartment. That was very, very difficult. And the work wasn't done because you had gone down there to translate the Bible and the work wasn't done yet. It wasn't done. No. And uh, we didn't know what to do for a while. We kind of went myself more than my wife. I really got discouraged. All these, you know, we had lost contact with the sheep, so to speak. We didn't have these dear people to work with anymore. The teaching ceased. Everything ceased. The translation ceased. And we wondered what to do. And we went to a neighboring country to visit where they had to also do a lot of changing because, because of political pressure. Yeah, it was so cool. We got some good insights from there, and then we got back to our host country, and we set up a safe house, a rendezvous point, well outside of the indigenous territory. And we began to meet there and bring out key uh, pastors and translation helpers, and that's where we finished the translation. We finished it in 2016, and then so we gave them their Bible in February of uh, 2016. So that was a beautiful time. God helped us cross the finish line on the translation. Fantastic. Yeah, he, he did it, uh, Tim. He worked in and through us. You know, we're just a couple of very ordinary people from very ordinary backgrounds, you know, and people always ask us, how did you get into missions? 
what was your call? And, and like, uh, hello, we didn't have a call. We didn't have a dream. We didn't have a vision. We were just reading our Bibles. And it said, it kept saying, go, go. So we thought, well, go, probably go means go. <laughs> You're pretty smart. <laughs> Since Jesus said, go, we said, yeah, we're going to, we're going to do this. And it was interesting. Some believers even tried to discourage us. They said, this mm. work, you know, missions, this is tough stuff. We were both committed to it. Yeah. We, we wanted to do. Now, you say you're just ordinary people. I think you're a little, little different than ordinary. And I want you to share some of that story. We're going to take a quick break. Our founder, Alan McGurl, is why Florida have been taking us through God's word. And then we're going to come back with Ethnos Missionary. I forgot to mention you're with Ethnos, uh, Meryl Dick, and to tell a little bit about how you got from being that new believer out to the mission field, even with those other Christians saying, I don't know if you should go. So friends, don't go away. We want to hear Meryl's story right after this. Well, Flory, last time we started the discussion about the many terms that are used when a person becomes a true child of God. We talked about the term born again, as explained in John 3. Today, we deal with a new term, saved, or salvation. There are many verses that refer to being saved or salvation that are too numerous to mention here, but we're going to deal with a few of them right now. I remember Alan, a friend of mine who went to a Christian camp as a teenager. He called home one night to tell his parents he had been saved. They were confused and wondered if he had had a swimming mishap or some other misadventure. His parents were completely oblivious to what he meant. He had the opportunity to share with them that he had turned his life over to Jesus to be saved from sin. His unchurched parents were very skeptical and adopted the attitude that this was just an emotional response that would soon pass. If we're looking at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. From these verses, we discover that being saved is a gift from God. It is not something we can do for ourselves but we do need to believe in what God has done for us. And this same verse tells us it is God's grace, his unmerited favor towards us, that brings about salvation. Again, if we look at Acts 4.12, we hear Peter and John say, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. From this verse, we not only learn that salvation is a gift, It is a must. If we are to be delivered from the consequences of our sin, we must have salvation. They were very straightforward in declaring that this salvation is found in no one except Jesus. Jesus himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Again, when Paul and Silas were in prison, the jailer fell at their feet and said, What must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. The jailer believed, along with all his household, and Paul and Silas continued to teach them the truths about Jesus and the life he came to bring. Romans 5 goes into depth on this issue of salvation. Verse 9 says, Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more, being reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Here Paul states that it is through the shed blood of Jesus that we can only be justified. Once we are justified, we no longer face God's wrath. Instead, we are reconciled to God through Jesus' death and saved by his resurrected life. So what are we saved from? The Bible states clearly that we all will have to give account for the sins we have committed, and the sentence meted out by God is eternal death, eternal separation from Him, eternal suffering. God saw our predicament and planned from before the beginning of time that He would send His Son to provide the salvation we needed. The plan was that Jesus would take the punishment for our sin. It's for this reason he was born as a human child into this world. 
As a human being, he could pay the price for human sin. But he is also God, and so his sacrifice is not only applied to one human being, but rather it is infinite. He offers salvation to anyone who will accept his death on their behalf and trust in him for salvation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation. John 3 tells us, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Hebrews reminds us, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? And we read again in Thessalonians, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of man. So what are we saved from? We can, by God's grace and provision, made through the death and resurrection of Jesus, be forgiven of our sin, the sin that bars us from God and seals our eternal condemnation. We are saved to new life in Him. And what is this sin? It is anything that we think, say, or do that is contrary to God's law. Wow. As the Bible says, that leaves us all condemned before God. We can deny we have sinned. We can deny that we need to be saved. We can pretend that our good deeds will outweigh our bad deeds, but believing in any of these things doesn't make it true. No, it's only when we recognize that we have sinned against a holy God. Repent and ask for forgiveness of that sin and trust Jesus to save us that we can escape the consequences of sin. What an amazing salvation. I trust that you have found God's forgiveness through Jesus Christ. If not, why not? And why not now? God bless you all. Welcome back to the Mission Compass, your guide to the Great Commission. We've been talking with Merrill Dick, ethnos missionary uh, in South America, working with an indigenous tribe from not knowing anything about Christ to going in, planting nine churches, translating the Bible. It's, it's wonderful work. I don't think we've been, we've been, Merrill, you've been saying it so matter of factly that perhaps we're not seeing the scope of what you've done here. But going back from the beginning, when we first started talking about getting you solar powered radios and audio Bibles uh, to work in with this Indigenous community, offhanded, you just made this comment about kind of coming out of the drug culture and God saving you. Share a little bit about your story. Yeah, I'm a preacher's kid. And yet I didn't buy it. I uh, rejected what my parents taught. Yeah, I was just sort of a party animal. We uh, started on the wild life in, in the teen years, and there was more and more involvement with drugs. We were doing uh, smoking weed all the time and, and hash. And then we got going on speed and we were dropping acid every weekend. Besides that, to buy all the dope, I became a kleptomaniac. So everywhere I went, I stole and ended up in jail for a while. Yeah, played keyboards in a rock band, the ball and chain. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all kinds of things. And it was such an empty life. You know, the first time you get a buzz, it's it's great. And But, you know, after you've done it uh, 75, 100 times, well, everything gets old. And then there was that empty vacuum in my heart. And I remember one time we had this huge party out in the country. We uh, had alcohol and LSD. And... Uh, I got wiped out on both of them. And about three in the morning, I was sick, went outside, ended up under a tree, sitting there on the ground and just began to think. And I just thought, wow, this really is not living. This type of living sucks. This is not too cool. I kind of, I saw two balances in my mind, just a big balance, you know, one eternity with God and eternity in uh, the lake of fire. And I thought, wow, you know, I'm not making some cool choices. So anyway, long story short, I got saved the next morning by myself in my bedroom. Wow. Just uh, God was working in my heart and I just knelt beside my bed and I just uh, told the Lord, I believe what Christ had done for me on the cross, thanked him for dying for my sins. And uh, yeah, it was all kind of surreal. That night I went to a Hell's Angel movie at a theater and just sat there sort of, I didn't even get the movie. I just watched it. It was so strange, but right away my life changed totally. This tremendous peace overwhelmed me and uh it was wonderful. And just two months later, there was this missionary conference. And again, we're hearing about missions, unreached people groups, and, and they're talking about, this is the command that, that our Lord owner boss, Jesus, is giving us. 
And uh, I thought, man, I want to do this. And I knew who I was. I was a party animal. And uh, but, you know, God uses the weak and the foolish. Mm. And I was very foolish. And yet I was so thankful that I had been now born again, locked into the security of God's goodness and locked into the safety of Christ. And so I thought, yeah, we're going to launch on missions. We're going to do it. Wow. Yeah. So pretty much right away, right away, you knew that you needed to obey that command and go. It was just like I wanted to. And then later when I met my wife, yeah, she had the same thing. She totally wanted to. We wanted to do this uh, in our limited knowledge of scripture and everything. It's like, what a privilege to be able to take the gospel to an unreached people group, right? And we are reading verses like we are his ambassadors. Mm. You know, you can tell people, you know, be reconciled to God. We were reconciled to God. We were far off and messed up. And he brought us close and started hugging us and put us on his lap. And that's actually the way that the indigenous people talk. They say, God, we're always on God's lap and he's always hugging us. That's the way they talk about his um, love for them. That's incredible. Uh, friends, we, we always say here that, that, that kind of the tagline of our program is your guide to the Great Commission, because we want you to get involved as somehow, some way, somewhere as a missionary. And I think too many people go, oh, God can't use me. I got too much baggage. You got a lot of baggage there, Meryl, but it looks like God just cleaned your slate and sent you on. And you, you've been tremendously effective in this, in this indigenous group. Do you see a, a correlation between what God brought you from to how he used you in this culture? Well, I think a key theme in our lives has been, we are weak, but he is strong. We are insufficient in ourselves, but God is our sufficiency. And uh, like Paul said, when I am weak, then am I strong? That was so helpful. We were aware of our own inabilities. I flunked French bad in school, you know, and yet here I had to learn Spanish first and then another language. But God, you know, like when you set out to serve the Lord, you don't know all that God's going to do for you. God can empower you. God can give you gifts. And I found out I had gifts that I had had no idea that I had. God equips you to do the task before you. God rocks. That's the truth. God rocks. God does the above and beyond stuff. He does above and beyond all that we could ask or think. Amen. He is the above and beyond God. And so he takes a weak and foolish vessel that makes himself available to him. And he, he does stuff through us. And that way God gets the glory. Oh, and we dare not touch the glory that belongs to God alone. This is him, right? He's done for the, for this people group. It's all about God. It's all about his bigness, his greatness, and what he does through an ordinary person. And, you know, I always think about the quote from Robert Murray McShane, the Scottish preacher. He said, an obedient person is a powerful tool in the hands of Almighty God. Amen. So we got a couple minutes left. Let's talk about the project that we're partnering on. So you've translated a big chunk of the Old Testament, the entire New Testament. It's in written form, but we want to get it in audio form. What's the plan? Well, that's uh, that's to come yet. Right now, I have about 250 hours of uh, teaching all in, in the indigenous language. The audio for the Bible will come down the road. We haven't got that ready yet, but that will come. And then the hope is, of course, to start putting out radio broadcasts into that territory, interviewing different people, but it's going to be teaching. It's going to be solid teaching. Uh, Russell said we could start with weekends and then maybe get a, get more programs Monday through Friday. So we'll see how it works. We're still in the process of developing Bible curriculum for the indigenous people. They're asking for this curriculum. So we're busy with that. And now on top of that, radio broadcasts. So uh, we're not worried about unemployment. It's lots of work. Lots of work, but it's but it, not, neither of us want to retire, right? I mean, uh, we, we're, we're slowing down a little bit, but things are way too exciting to uh, to hang out on the golf course. Amen. As much as I love golf, I agree. There's too much for you to be hanging out there. So friends, we're right out of time, but if you want to participate, if you want to give towards this task, we want to get kind of a, a sample batch of radios down with these teachings on it, fixed tuned to Russell Stendhal station there. We want to hit 300. So all you got to do is if you want to send a gift in, but either on our website or by check and just write Merrill Dick, uh, M-E-R-R-I-L-L-D-Y-C-K, we're going to be watching for those and we're going to attribute any gifts that come in towards getting these first batch of radios with this audio teaching 
uh, to this people group. Meryl, we went over it. I love your story. Thank you for sharing, but we're out of time. God bless you. It's great to be partnering with you. We'll have to have you back on once we kind of get everything rolling here. Okay. And get that first batch readers down. But friends, partner with us in this. Meryl, thanks so much for joining us this week here on, on Mission Compass. Thank you, Tim. God bless. Well, friends, we're at the end of our program today. You've been listening to Mission Compass, your guide to the Great Commission, presented by Galcom International. You know, there are many ways you can partner with us at Galcom in reaching the lost for Christ. You can pray for us. You can volunteer. You can join us on a mission trip. You can help us financially to build more solar-powered radios and audio Bibles and deliver them to people in remote villages around the world. You could even sponsor an entire village with its own Christian radio station. Ask God how He would want you to partner with us. It's easy to reach us. Our website is galcom.org. That's galcom, spelled G-A-L-C-O-M, dot org. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. I'm Ron Harris. Thanks for joining us today on Mission Compass, a radio ministry of Galcom International.